Good morning. Hope everybody's doing well, recovering from a fantastic evening last night. Uh, yesterday was an amazing day, and we look forward uh, to another series of inform informative and entertaining sessions uh, this morning and this afternoon. But before I begin, or before we begin, I'd like to recognize uh, conference sponsor, the Coca-Cola Company, recognize Union Pacific, the National Restaurant Association for supporting CHCI and helping make this plenary possible. I encourage you to take out your phones and alert your coworkers, your families, and your friends so that they can also experience what we're going to have a discussion today via live webcast on the address shown on the screens. This session is just one of a number of high-level programs that CHCI is proud to offer during Hispanic Heritage Month. As a signature sponsor of CHCI, Dell is happy and honored to be part of this year's public policy conference. I'm here today to introduce a very exciting session that will allow us to explore and discuss issues that are impacting the Latino community. I'm particularly excited to hear from our experts as they talk about their experiences as leaders, innovators in their respective industries, navigating policy issues that impact housing, innovation, the food industry, and immigration. As we all have witnessed, learned, and discussed throughout the couple of days at the conference, the Latino demographic in the United States continues to grow at a rapid pace, and market and workforce strategies need to adapt to those changes. At Dell, we believe that to be a successful company and a great place to work, our business must be able to leverage the similarities and differences of all the team members that we work with. We work to create a mutually beneficial partnership with organizations such as CHCI in an effort to advance our marketplace and workforce diversity activities. Our commitment to diversity and inclusion is steadfast. We are proud that the commitment that our organization has shown has been recognized by various organizations. In fact, Dell for the fifth year running has been recognized uh, by diversity's top, inc top 50 companies by Diversity Inc. At Dell, we recognize that in a world that's constantly evolving, managing diversity and the changing landscape as cultures is essential for our collective success. In order to build enduring relationships, we must create a welcoming workplace where people of all backgrounds can work together and do their best work. Not only by em embracing individual differences, but actively leveraging them. Dell, is a, Dell likes to harness each and every individual to their fullest potential, drive innovation, foster an environment of a global team where they can do their best work, in particular and most importantly, to pave the way for our customers and our, and our partners in terms of their aspirations. We believe that CHCI and so many other organizations represented here today are great partners and we also would like to share in their success. Dell is committed to continuing these discussions and being a part of the solution by providing unique opportunities and perspectives on how to address innovation in the Latino community. For the last two years, Dell has hosted a small and intimate roundtable focused on diversity at Dell's South by Southwest Innovation Weekend. At South by Southwest, we invite policymakers to meet with diverse entrepreneurs eager to tell their stories and discuss the challenges that face, that face them regarding innovating, developing disruptive te technologies, go-to-market strategies, and in most importantly, navigating across different means in terms of how to gather mentorship and capital for their startups. We also brought together policy experts, entrepreneurs, grad students to complete an in-policy hackathon where they work collaborative to answer pressing policy questions addressing the needs of a diversified workforce, STEM training, and career opportunities for Latinos. I want to take this opportunity first to thank Congressman Lujan, Congressman diaz Balart, Congressman Flores, Congressman Castro, Congressman Vela, and Cong Congressman Cardenas for attending Dell's 2015 South by Southwest Innovation Weekend, and we hope to see them and more in the future. We look forward to growing our diversity events at Dell and South by Southwest and continuing to work with members of Congress to develop greater awareness of the needs expressed by our Latino entrepreneurs. 
Now, I'd like to ask Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez to begin our session. Please welcome a woman committed to supporting initiatives to ensure that families are able to avoid foreclosure and keep a roof over their head. Representing the 46th District of California, Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez. Thank you. Good morning. Buenos dias. I see some people are sleeping. I'm kidding. I mean, I can't even see you because the lights are too bright. But thank you so much for being here. And um, this morning session, immigration and beyond. So we really want to talk about so many issues that affect our community. And I want to thank, first of all, CHCI, and of course, the head of CHCI, my sister Linda, for allowing me to be here today to talk to you about housing and financial literacy. Uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of things. Uh, ben Ray is going to talk about activism and getting involved and how our community has evolved. Uh, we have Chef Andres, who is going to be here, um, not giving out samples this morning. But he is going to talk about the food industry and how we are changing it and what we need to do, especially when so much of our community works in it. And of course, we're going to end with um, Secretary Johnson and my co-chair of the Immigration Task Force for the CHC, that would be Luis Gutierrez, talking about immigration and really getting the nitty gritty and the facts of what we're trying to do and what's happening. So this morning I'm supposed to talk about housing. I want to start with a little story about my own family. You all have your stories. We all have our stories in our families. So I want to talk to you about housing. So you know, um, when I was running the first time for Congress 20 years ago, I went to see my grandma as I would um, usually two or three times a week. And I went, she was living with my mother and um, I went up the stairs and I went into her room and there was my grandma, right? And her little Jesus altar with the little candles and everything going on, right? And I went up to talk to her. I said, hey, Grandma, I'm going to go to Washington, D.C. I'm running for the Congress, as you know, and um, I need to go and talk to some people. This was a Thursday night. And she started to cry. Don't go, Loretta. Mijita, you can't go to Washington, D.C. I said, Grandma, why not? She says, because I'm going to die. I said, oh, come on, Grandma, you're not going to die. Todo esto era en español, eh? She says, yeah, she says, I feel it. If you go to Washington, D.C., by the time you come back, I'm going to have been dead. I said, no, Grandma. And she was crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, I feel like I have been a failure in the United States. Well, Grandma, why would you say that? And she said, there are two things that I wanted to do and I didn't accomplish. I said, Grandma, what's that? She said, first, she wanted to meet the Pope. She was muy católica, no? And she said, second, I wanted to own my own home. Here she was, living in a room in my mother's house. She said, I just wanted a little house, una casita. Pequeña, no tenía que ser mucho, it didn't have to be a lot. Just a little house that she could call her own. Con un jardín, she was a great gardener. Donde ponía poner sus, sus, ma, ma, sus uh, flores, sus cosas, no? And she was crying, I said, Grandma, you are a success. And I went to Washington, and on Monday night I got a call from my mother. And she said, your grandmother has died. My grandmother was a success in the United States. She measured her success by whether she owned a home or not. But I got to tell you, my grandmother is the only one on that day when my sister came to the Congress for the first time 
and we were sitting in the chamber and we had our hands up to be sworn in to the United States Congress. She was the only grandmother with two granddaughters in the Congress. And I thought, I thought about what she had said to me, and I looked up and I said, Grandma, I hope you know you're a success. Because that's what our community is about. It's generational. We're pulling each other through, and we're living our lives through our kids and our grandkids, right? So this whole concept of a house, a home, so important, so important to our wealth creation in our community. Our homes. We use them to sell our, send our kids to college. We use them when someone gets sick in the family. We use them to start our own businesses when others won't let us move up in the corporation. The home is so central. And most importantly, the home creates the place where the family gathers. So can you imagine, can you imagine in this last recession, when we as a community lost two-thirds of our worth, of our net wealth, two-thirds, 66, we were the hardest hit community in this recession. And it happened because we lost our homes. And you know if you go out, just like in my district in Orange County, and Throughout California, if you go to the Latino home, most of us are now renting. We're in apartments or we're in homes. We're renting, in some cases, we're renting back the same home for twice the price and building no equity in our community. Housing, it's incredibly important to us. And it begins with financial literacy. It begins with classes. In elementary and secondary schools, we need to make sure they're there. For those of you who do not know how important it is that we get our people on school boards, on school boards, because we need to build knowledge of financial literacy early on. For those of you who don't understand how important it is to get our people on city councils, because zoning and building and housing, la vivienda, it's controlled at the city level. For those of you who don't understand how important it is to run for the state legislatures, because they move the money and they build opportunity in community. We need you. And of course, here at the federal level, the tax credits and the homeowner's exemption and the savings plans, the ability for us to put together that little down payment to buy that first home. So if I just leave you with one thing today, it's that we need you involved. I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here, but you need to understand, I want to enthuse you to go back into your cities, into your communities. Find those people for the school boards, for the water boards, for the housing boards for the city councils, for the county commissioners and county supervisors at the state level. We control our destiny. Nobody is going to hand it to us. Once in a while, we might get a hand to help us up. But most of the time, son estas manos. Son tuas manos. Son nuestras manos. It is our hands that create the opportunity for our community. So, enjoy. You're going to have some great speakers next. 
Latinos are finding their voice, and we must listen to them. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, uh, Congressman Sanchez. Uh, now let's take a new direction in our conversation and discuss innovation and activism. Please join me in welcoming New Mexico's third, from New Mexico's third district, the land of enchantment, Congressman Ben Ray Lujan. All right, good morning, everyone. I think Loretta got us going. Let's give another hand for Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez. Recognize the work of Ed Loya, who has been giving us some great introductions this morning from Dell, and some of the Dell team is with us this morning. Maricela and Chris Turner, wherever you are, give a little stand so that way Dell can be acknowledged. Please give Dell a round of applause, everyone. And a couple of our sponsors for today that made today possible. We should recognize the work of Union Pacific and the National Restaurant Association, everyone. So please give them a round of applause. All right. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if I should have you all stand up real quick and then sit back down so that I get those, that blood flowing through the body and get you moving at 8 o'clock in the morning. But I think that we're okay. Uh, as we have a conversation leading off of the inspiration and the very personal story that Congresswoman Sanchez shared with us, I think it's important that we understand what it takes to make sure that our voices are amplified, magnified, that our voices are heard, and that we're not going to sit idly behind as things happen around us. So as I challenge you and I talk to you, I, I want to share a, a few statistics with you as we, we move through this and then maybe bring a bit of a challenge to each and every one of you. So, Today, Hispanics, we know Latinos are one of the fastest growing populations in the United States, right? We're reminded of that every day. We talk to our family and friends about that every day. More than 60,000 Latinos turn 18 every month. That's like one every 30 seconds. There, there's a lot of us, right? Latinos are becoming more and more responsible, not just for the innovations that we depend on and use every day, but innovations that are changing the world changing the way that we interact with society. I see some smart watches out there, interactives, wearables, Fitbits. Um, I'm sure a bunch of you have smartphones, right? As a matter of fact, how many of you have smartphones in the audience? You raise your hands. I think every hand went up. So that answers one of the questions with some of the facts I'm gonna show you here in a little bit. But what does our community look like? Not only are we one of the fastest growing populations in America, one of the best looking populations in America. <laughs> but we're a young population. And the mere fact of all of you that are here today show the average of the age, and we, we see 27.3, whatever that may be, right? 27 and four months compared to the average age of the rest of America at 37. We're a young population, we're an engaging population, and we're a population that's going to make a difference. So it's not just the growing populations that we have in California and the Southwest, places like Illinois, New York, Florida, and here in Washington, D.C., but that demographic is growing in places like Georgia, Alabama, and the Carolinas, and the Deep South, something that surprises quite a few folks. But those of you from Georgia, from the Carolinas, and from the South that are here today, know the trends that are happening that are impacting our lives. So it's important that you understand the power of your voice and you're reminded of this daily, but sometimes we don't exercise it. And I say that because when those problems with compounding student debt are impacting you or we're not doing everything that we can to mobilize our family and friends and our allies, to encourage those members of the United States Congress around the United States that are still not there with us to pass comprehensive immigration reform, we need your help. Because while we're one of the fastest growing populations in the country, we have one of the lowest voting participations. We're giving our voice away. We're happy with not speaking up. Now, does that represent you? I heard a couple no's. Does that represent you? Are, are you happy with 
just staying home and making sure your voices aren't heard? Thank you. You're here. By being a member of CHCI and one of the most competitive programs around the United States, you've left your homes, you've left your lives behind to come and serve where maybe you get a cup of coffee or maybe you'll get half a bagel somewhere. But you're doing it to make a difference, to change our lives, to change what's happening in our communities with how we're perceived as a young, growing Latino community in America. Your voice matters. So I'm going to ask you to use it. So while this is a concerning trend that we see with that slide on the board, we can do something about it. How many of you are using Snapchat today? Just throw a hand, put them up. Pandora, I know that it's for older people like me, but some of you are still using Pandora, I'm sure. How about Spotify? A few people using Spotify. A few people still on Facebook? A few, again, older, I think we show the, the generation gap when the hands go up. But the reason I ask that is, um, you know, I know that when we're in town here, some of us are still using taxis, right? But how many of you are using Uber? Things are changing around us. The use of technology allows us to be more mobile, to reach out to people. You know, when Gandhi had to travel the world to be able to share his message by word of mouth, with that little device you have in your hands, you can touch a million people just like that. It's quick. It's fast, and you can mobilize a community. You know, we should not forget that Nelson Mandela reminded us that it always seems impossible until it's done. So whatever those issues are that are challenging you, that are motivating you, I want you to make sure that you're doing something with it by getting people engaged and involved. So with all the hands that went up in the room, across the country, 49% of Latinos are tapped into technology when it comes to smartphone adoption. 68% of all Latinos use sites like Facebook and Twitter and Spotify to be able to engage society. Students mobilized around the DREAM Act on Twitter to mobilize a community, setting off a chain reaction on social networking that brought dreamers together to make sure that we called on the administration to act. And we should acknowledge Secretary Jay Johnson and the work of President Barack Obama for pushing forward with DAPA and with DACA, and we will win that fight in the courts. So let's make sure we give them a round of applause. Now, how many of you have heard of uh, an actress by the name of Rosario Dawson? Anybody here know who Rosario Dawson is? So Rosario is the founder of an organization called Voto Latino. Some of you have heard of Voto Latino. But the other incredible thing that Rosario is doing with Voto Latino and with all of the friends that she's had participate is they launched something called VL Innovators Challenge. Some of you may have been recipients of that recognition last year, maybe even competed. This is a way to challenge each and every one of you, not just to use apps, but to write them. Not just to be able to navigate the internet, but provide the map forward when it comes to coding. So not only do we have a social responsibility when it comes to making sure our voices are heard, with organizing a community, with making sure that we're adopting technology and that we're writing the code, what I appreciate about the young Latinos here in the room is you understand the power and the importance of social responsibility. Inherently in your DNA, you want to make things better. And you challenge corporations to make things better. And you reward them by using their products. So for what you already have in your heart, in your soul, I want to ask you to make sure that we amplify that voice. Because when our voices are not heard, we have a problem that plagues communities. And I'm going to take you back a few decades real quick. We should not forget the plight of the farm workers. When Cesar Chavez was told that he'd be able to mobilize an entire country to bring recognition to the way that workers were being treated, pesticides that were being spread around that were making them sick, told him it was impossible. Pero que dijo el Cesar Chavez a la gente en la lucha para los trabajadores? Que dijo? Si se puede. And he did it. Like Nelson Mandela, he knew that the impossible would not be impossible until he got it done. 
What he understood was the power of organizing. So I'm asking you today as we go back to the basics and we talk to our friends, and it's okay to pick up the phone and talk with your voice, <laughs> to go and knock on a door and learn from your abuela and your abuelito, to share the message of what it takes for us to organize and come together, but use the power of the technology that's in your hands today to mobilize, to organize, and make sure that we bring responsible social change to our country so that no one is left behind. Muchisimas gracias, CHCI. Go out and change the world and do something great. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Congressman Lujan. Uh, words, to, to words to ponder, words to act on. Now let's uh, change gears a little bit again as we consider the uh, impact of immigration on the food service industry. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage a man who began his life in America as an immigrant from Spain and is now a naturalized U.S. citizen. He is a renowned chef, innovator, educator, and philanthropist. He believes that chefs can play and will play a role in the food service industry and has been very active to that regard. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chef Jose Andres. Señor. Buenos dias. Good morning. Are you happy to be here? Yeah. What? Yeah. Because I am very happy. My name is Jose Andres. I am a cook. I am a cook. A good one. And I'm honored to be telling you that I cook every day of my life with thousands of amazing Latinos, cooks like me, that they do a heck of an awesome job feeding America. Yeah, you can clap. And let me tell you very quickly, because I came to this country first time serving on the Navy of Spain. I came on a boat, on a sailing ship, four masts. And I still remember the day that I was coming under the Barasano Bridge with Ellis Island on my left, the Statue of Liberty, and the beautiful American flag with all the beautiful stars right there welcomed me. A year later, I came back after I finished my Navy years. And I came back because I saw a country that was here ready to be giving opportunities to many, and especially to Latinos like me. In case there's any immigration officer in the room, we have Homeland Security Secretary, I came legal here <laughs> with an E2 visa. And I'm gonna be bragging a little bit, but I think it's for the right reason. You know that lately you hear some people, some call politicians, that they are putting kind of a doubt of why some immigrants are here? I was given the right opportunity, and today I can tell you I have over 20 restaurants. I have over 2,000 employees working with me. We feed millions of people over the last 20 years. And I'm telling you this not as bragging and as saying, wow, look at this guy showing off. I'm only saying it because we have to be telling us immigrants to the world, in case somebody didn't hear this well, that we are here contributing. We are here making this country great. Nobody has to make America great again because America is already the greatest country on earth. And people like us, we are only gonna keep moving it forward. So let me tell you very quickly. I came in 1993, I was hired by an immigrant, Roberto Alvarez, my partner, who became ambassador of Dominican Republic. And I hired, he hired me and I hired a Bolivian called Rodolfo Guzman. He began being the dishwasher. My God, today he owns houses. He's the head chef of my Jaleo restaurant. He's invested in some of my restaurants. I'm gonna be sending him away because if not, he's gonna be taking my job. <laughs> this is what immigrants are. A man that came from Bolivia with dreams, began being the dishwasher, and today is running one of my best restaurants. Every day, showing up, showing the way to immigrants like him. So. In case you don't know, I want you to give you some numbers, okay? The restaurant industry, every year, has 700 billion 
in cells. 700 billion in cells. Yes, that's why we are all a little bit overweight. <laughs> 14 million employees work preparing those meals every day. And by the year 2025, more than close to 2 million jobs are going to be added. Restaurants are creating jobs like nobody. And many are created by immigrants just like me. But the most important thing is that 2.5 million undocumented workers is what the Pew Hispanic Center is estimating that work in America today. 2.5 million undocumented. Who knows somebody that is undocumented? Anybody? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Do you think this is right? We are feeding America, but somehow some people is not giving those people the right to do it as the same way I did it, legally, contributing to America, walking up every day, paying taxes, keep opening restaurants, creating jobs, being a family man. That's why immigration reform for the restaurant industry is so important. We are going to be the motor of moving this country forward, and we are going to be needing workers. And we are not going to have enough US-born citizens to cover the need of those jobs. So we need immigration. So we have some clever maniac saying that we are going to be kicking out 11 million people. People of America, all Latinos, who is going to be feeding America if we kick everybody that is feeding America out? That's what we need to stand for. And that's what we need to start claiming for immigration reform. So here I'm talking like a citizen, I'm talking like a human being, I'm talking like a businessman, I'm talking like one more guy that is working on the line every day in the restaurant. And that's why I'm calling for this immigration reform. We're not gonna be feeding the world if we start building walls. Walls, every single wall that you see in history has been teared down. Everyone. And now some clever wants to build one. This is not the way forward. And let me give you one more uh, piece. Who, who knows about minimum wage? Everybody talks about minimum wage. Minimum wage by the year uh, 1st of July, 2016, next year, is going to be 1150. It's a good start. I'm going to tell you, as a businessman, we've been 1150 a long time ago. And actually, not many of my workers, my team, the people that work with me, is at 1150. Many of them are way beyond that. Why is this important? And why this has to do with Latinos like us? If you and I, we go today to a place I adore, because it's the place that we are ruling and running America. If we go to Congress, and we go where senators and congressmen of America, working hard, congressmen and senators of America, abiding by the rule of law. When they feed you, you're eating vegetables. You're eating carrots and peas and salad. Those come from a farm somewhere in the heart of beautiful America. And I visit those farms. And more often than not, the people picking up those fruits, those vegetables that they are being served at the Capitol are undocumented immigrants, that we are paying them way below the minimum wage, and we are using them. And the day they finish the harvest, the only thing we want to do is kicking them out. This is not the America I know. This is not the America we want. What we want is that every one of those people that are helping feed America receive legal status so we can keep feeding America in the right way and we keep paying every one of those individuals at the very least the minimum wage or more so Americans, everybody living here, can move themselves and their families forward on their own. It is a big lie that we will pay people it is a big lie that we will pay people so low, so low, and not documented, that they cannot take care of themselves and their families. Offshore, after they have to go on welfare. Offshore, after they have to go on SNAPs. Offshore, after they have to be uh, receiving health care uh, assistance. If we start paying every single citizen, every single undocumented, and I hope soon documented, immigrants, 
the right amount to make sure they make it on their own. We can close all those soup kitchens. We can take away SNAPs because everybody will be benefiting from the American wealth that this country creates everybody. We only need to make sure that we are not only taking care about ourselves, but taking care about everybody around us. This to me is the new American dream, not only caring for your own, but caring for others that they are around you and they are hoping to achieve the same level of success that every one of us achieves. Ladies and gentlemen, I do believe that if I'm asking you something that can be changing America for good, creating jobs, especially in the restaurant industry, lifting up people from poverty, raising their hopes for a better horizon, a better future, is when our Congress, our politicians, will pass this immigration reform that will keep helping restaurant owners like me keep opening restaurants with the best possible immigrants documented, keep moving the economy of America forward, and keeping this country the greatest country on the face of Earth. My name is Jesus Andres, and I was so happy to be with you today. Wow, let's give Chef Andres another round of applause. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna wrap up today's discussion with a presentation on immigration. Here to introduce our next speaker is the chairman of, immigra of the Immigration Task Force for the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, representing the 4th con Congressional District of Illinois, Congressman Luis Gutierrez. Good morning. So I have a distinct pleasure. Oh, they have this here too. I'll put this out here. It's really a distinct pleasure to be here with you this morning here in Washington, D.C. I welcome you all to CHCI and to this wonderful conference. We're going to have a great hour together because we have somebody who is critically important to our community. Uh, but before I say that, before I introduce him, I want to just say that I visited five high schools in the last um, six days in my congressional district, all juniors and seniors, so over 2,000 young men and women. And everywhere I went, the number one question was, what are you going to do about Donald Trump? Number one question, juniors and seniors. Some kids said, what are you gonna do if he wins congressman and he comes to take away my mom and dad or revokes my American citizenship? What are you gonna do if he actually builds a wall between Mexico and the United States? I mean, there's a lot of fear and trepidation in the community. And I just wanna say that the enthusiasm and the energy of those kids uh, lets me know that our future is really bright and really well, because they're all organizing in every high school across this country. And, and I tell them, you're the answer. You're the antidote, right? They're all registering to vote, and they're all helping their moms and their dads. So we had a citizenship workshop two Saturdays ago. 400 people showed up at 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning with $685 to become citizens. They're the tip of the iceberg. And those youngsters that are in junior and senior, they're all registering to vote. And you know what? In politics, the person with the most votes wins. We're going to have the most votes next November 2016. I want to, so the Honorable Secretary, Jay Johnson, he was sworn in on December 23rd, 2013, as the fourth Secretary of Homeland Security. Prior to joining the Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Johnson served as General Counsel for the Department of Defense, where he oversaw the development of the legal aspects of many of our nation's counterterrorism policies, spearheaded reforms to the military commission system at Guantanamo Bay, and co-authored the 250-page report 
that paved the way for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Yeah, give him a round of applause for that. <laughs> Secretary Johnson graduated from Morehouse, Morehouse, Morehouse College in 1979 and received his law degree from Columbia Law School in 1982. Okay, now that I got that out of the way, let me tell you about the man I really know. From the first time we met, I knew there was something about this guy. Something in the way he operated and talked and carried himself that gave me the impression that he understands social justice. Well, as I got to know him, I figured it out. Aside from being a brilliant lawyer and civil servant in his own right, the secretary has social justice in his blood. He showed me, and I still have on my desk, an article that Charles Johnson, his grandfather, su abuelo, wrote for the New York Times Magazine in 1956 called A Southern Negro's View of the South. At that point, his grandfather, Charles S. Johnson, had been president of Fisk University for 10 years. And he wrote in that article, bitterness grows out of hopelessness. Bitterness grows out of hopelessness. And there is no sense of hopelessness in this situation. However uncomfortable and menacing and humiliating it may be at times, faith in the ultimate strength of the democratic philosophy and code of the nation as a whole has always been stronger than the impulse to despair. In other words, his grandfather's philosophy could be summed up by the words, the arc, of, the arc of the moral universe is long and it bends towards justice. In fact, Secretary Johnson, I pestered him a whole bunch and he shared with me a little bit more about it because I was really intrigued about his grandfather. And so I, I got a letter and this letter, his grandfather, received this letter uh, after he wrote the article in 1956. And the letter reads, this is a letter to the secretary's grandfather. Somebody wrote him this letter. They wrote, it is the best article I have read in the whole area. I am sure the more this article is read, it will bring about a greater understanding of the Negro's point of view as he struggles for first class citizenship. Citizenship, for first class citizenship. That letter to his grandfather was signed by the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., minister, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Montgomery, Alabama. So Dr. Martin Luther King praised what he saw in this man's grandfather, his character and his insights. I cannot bless or bestow on the grandson the same praise, nor would it carry the same weight as Dr. King. But I want you to understand two points. He is one of the most important law enforcement figures in our country, but in his DNA, there is an understanding of what justice really means. I do not always agree with him, and I many times argue with him, but I feel he understands that when we ask him for something, it's not on a whim or because I thought it up that morning, but rather because we're all fighting for justice and let us figure out a way to get there together. And number two, I can only hope my grandson, Luis Andres Figueroa Gutierrez, carries just one little grain of my DNA two generations later, the way Secretary Johnson carries his grandfather's DNA with him in all he does. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce the Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson. Good morning, everybody. I said good morning, everybody. Come on. All right. Luis, thank you for putting my prepared remarks down on the floor <laughs> where they might belong. Um, let me begin by paying a real tribute to Luis Gutierrez. He is 
in my 58 years experience, probably the most passionate advocate for his cause, which is the right of immigrants in this country. I've had Luis Gutierrez to my home for dinner. I've learned a lot from him. I've, I've seen the passion and enthusiasm. This man believes in what he works so hard for, not as a matter of politics, because he believes it in his heart. I'll never forget, I had Luis over to dinner one night with my wife here in Washington to talk about immigration reform. Luis is very effective. The next day, my wife, not me, my wife, received a really nice bowl of flowers with a note, dear Susan, I know you believe as I do. Very effective. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to be here today. Truth be told, I asked to speak to you. My message today is about our immigration policies and the reforms that we are making. My real message is about, and this is for the young people here, before the program started, I was down there and I met a lot of CHCI fellows. Gives me a lot of hope for the future. Mario Flores, who works for me, a decorated combat veteran of the US Army, who's been deployed to Afghanistan, now works for me today, is a graduate of the CHCI program. Let's give Mario a hand. type of people that this program produces. I was down there and I happened to meet a number of students from Albert Einstein's school here in Washington, D.C. Where are you? Give yourselves a hand, please. Give the high school students a hand. I asked them, what, what would you like to hear from the Secretary of Homeland Security, the person responsible for keeping everybody safe? Immigration policy. I intend to talk about that. About a month ago, I was honored to give a speech at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, right in the middle of this country's heartland. I gave the 56th Green Foundation Lecture at Westminster College. This is a place steeped in history. The most famous Green Lecture at Westminster College was given by Winston Churchill in 1946 the famous Iron Curtain speech. In 1954, Harry Truman gave a Green Lecture, which was the inspiration for my remarks a month ago. The title of his speech was, What Hysteria Does to Us. So in the wake of that address, what I said at Westminster College, I want to repeat here today. All of us in public office, those who aspire to public office and who command a microphone, owe the public calm, responsible dialogue and decision making, not overheated, oversimplistic rhetoric and proposals of superficial appeal. In a democracy, the former leads to smart and sustainable policy. The latter can lead to fear, hate, suspicion, prejudice, and government overreach. These words are especially true in matters of homeland security, and they are especially true in matters of immigration policy. Why do I say that? There is much misinformation and overheated rhetoric about our immigration policy in this country. Best evidence by a poll that was taken two years ago by Pew Research, which is a nonpartisan organization. The survey asked the following question two years ago. Quote, just your best guess, compared with 10 years ago, do you think the number of immigrants entering the U.S. illegally today is higher, lower, or about the same? A majority of those surveyed said 55% said it was their perception that there is more illegal immigration 
today than there was 10 years ago. In fact, the opposite is true. In fiscal year 2000, there were 1.6 million people apprehended on our southern border attempting to cross illegally. Apprehensions are an indicator of total attempts to cross the border illegally. 1.6 million 15 years ago. That number in recent years is now a fraction of what it used to be. In fiscal year 2013, 414,000. In fiscal year 2014, it went up a little bit, 479,000. In fiscal year 15, the year we just completed, we estimate that the number will be 331,000, give or take a few. The number in recent months has begun to rise again from Central America, an issue we must address. But in fact, last fiscal year, the number of apprehensions on our southern border were, with the exception of one year, the lowest since 1972. There is more we can do. As a sovereign nation, we must protect our borders. But building a wall across the entire southwest border is not the answer. Building a wall across <laughs> the windy Rio Grande, through the remote desert, and in mountains 10,000 feet high is not the answer. Investing hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of taxpayer money in building such a wall across the entire 19 100 mile border is not the answer. The best commentary on this that I heard was from a border security expert, somebody who works in DHS, who said, wait a minute, do you really think that a migrant from Central America who is motivated enough to travel the entire length south to north of Mexico and climb a 10,000 foot mountain is going to be deterred by a 10 foot wall? Or as somebody else once said, build a 15-foot wall, I'll show you a 16-foot ladder. <laughs> in fact, pursuant to the Secure Fence Act of 2006, we did build 700 miles of wall in the places where it makes sense. But for the future, more walls is not necessarily the answer. More technology for border security, not more walls. Perhaps the best advice I received last summer in the midst of the spike in migration from Central America was from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops in country processing to provide a lawful and safe path for families desperate to bring their children here. So we've established in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, in country processing for migrants and we are encouraging people in this country with children in Central America to use it. The longer term solution is an investment in Central America, which is why this administration has proposed to the Congress a $1 billion investment in those three countries to solve the longer term problems that we face. <laughs> the President and I are committed to fixing our broken immigration system. We are committed to comprehensive immigration reform. It's remarkable, 50 years ago, we passed the Immigration and Nationality Act, 50 years ago this week, in a Congress that consisted of a Democratic caucus, a majority caucus, that included a really wide range of views from Southern segregationists to Northern liberals. Yet, that Congress was able to pass the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965. Congress, despite the efforts of Luis and Loretta and others, has not passed comprehensive immigration reform, but we continue to make the case. We are determined to fix the system within our existing legal authority. The President's overall policy is a smart, common sense use of our resources to go after threats to public safety, felons, not families, quantity, quality over quantity, give people an opportunity 
to come forward and be held accountable and be accountable. We devised and announced a deferred action program for adults like Sophie Cruz's parents, the young girl who met the Pope several weeks ago. We're disappointed that we've not been able to move forward. I share in the disappointment. We're fighting that case in the courts. We're defending that case in the courts, and we are determined to win because it is the right thing to do. We issued 10 executive actions last year. Nine out of 10 of those are moving forward. One is in the courts, but the other nine are moving forward. The most significant of which is a realignment of our removal, deportation priorities to focus not on families, not on those who have been here for years and have committed no serious crimes, but to focus on convicted criminals. We are making our guidelines clearer. The Migration Policy Institute, the nonpartisan Migration Policy Institute, has said this about our new removal priorities. These prosecutorial discretion changes, which have received significantly less public attention than the Deferred Action Program, make it unlikely that unauthorized immigrants who would qualify for DACA or DAPA will be deported. The overall impact of the new memorandum is to describe DHS enforcement priorities more precisely and more narrowly than was the case under the 2010 and 2011 guidance, while broadening the circumstances under which DHS personnel should exercise discretion. Overall, the new enforcement policies have the potential to substantially transform the U.S. deportation system, particularly with the, within the U.S. interior. We're focused on criminals. We're focused on public safety and border security. Removals in fiscal year 2012, as many people know, reached a high of 409,000. Fiscal year 13, the number went down to 368. Fiscal year 14, the number went down, removals 315, 315,000. I anticipate that in fiscal year 15, the number will be significantly less than that. There are reasons for this decline in deportations. First reason, Immigration Customs Enforcement is actually doing what I told them to do, prioritize convicted criminals. Of those deported just in the period March to August 2015, 84% of those deported were in my top priority for removals, the felons, those at the border, the gang members, threats to national security, 84% of those deported in that top priority. Of those arrested in the same period, 94% in priorities one or two. At large arrest of those con convicted of felonies and significant misdemeanors has gone up, gone up 22% since last year. There are other reasons for this decline. Simply, there are fewer apprehensions on the southern border. The third significant reason is secure communities. We've ended secure communities. Secure communities was a legally and politically controversial program that led to barriers to our efforts to enforce and uphold public safety. In the period January 2014 to June 2015, there were 16,500 detainers not honored We've ended the Secure Communities Program, and we've replaced it with a common sense, more effective program that focuses on convicted criminals and does away with detainers. We've received a good reception so far to our new priority enforcement program. Of the 25 largest jurisdictions that accept detainers, 13 so far are now working with us again including in California, the counties of Alameda, Fresno, San Diego, San Mateo, Riverside, and Los Angeles. More are coming online, 
and I expect we will reach agreement with major cities in the very near future. We're making progress on other executive actions. We have issued a proposed rule to expand eligibility for provisional extreme hardship waivers for th to lift three and 10 year bars to persons who statutorily qualify for the waiver. The comment period is closed and we're now preparing to issue a final rule. Just today, this morning, we've issued guidance to clarify what the words extreme hardship mean, which we believe will have a significant effect on our efforts to improve the immigration system, to provide much needed clarity to the meanings of the words extreme hardship. This is something that Congressman Gutierrez, Congresswoman Lofgren, and others have fought for for years. On September 25th, the State Department and DHS made changes to the visa bulletin to enable certain families to apply for green cards sooner. We've almost completed guidance to assist the families of those defending our country in the U.S. military to obtain work permits. Within the next 30 days, we will provide public notice of a proposed rule to strengthen the program that provides optional practical training for students in STEM fields studying at U.S. universities. On May 26, we finalized a new rule that allows spouses of highly skilled H-1B workers to apply for a work authorization, or H-4 visa. We're promoting and increasing access to citizenship. Within one week, the week of September 14th to 21st, we launched, thanks to the leadership of Leon Rodriguez, who is here, we've launched Citizenship Week and Constitution Day, one week. And in one week, USCIS naturalized 40,000 people, 40,000 people. We now permit credit cards to pay for the naturalization fee. We continue to assess a partial fee waiver for the naturalization fee, an idea long championed by Luis and others. In terms of deferred action, we continue to fight the case in Texas and defend the case. We want to offer those who have been in this country for five years, who have children, who are citizens or lawful permanent residents, and who've committed no serious crimes, the opportunity to come forward and be counted, receive a work authorization, pay taxes, and get on the books. To those who say, we don't have the authority to do this without a change in law, I say, well then change the law. We must account for these people. We must account for these people and encourage them to be accountable. They are not going away. Notwithstanding the political rhetoric, we are not going to deport 11 million people. We're not going to deport a population of people equal in size to New York City and Chicago. They live among us. We know them. They're becoming integrated members of society. We want to offer those who have committed no serious crimes and who have been here the opportunity to come forward. We want to encourage them to come out of the shadows. For law enforcement reasons, for reasons of good government, and frankly because it is the right thing to do. The Pope, when he was here, reminded us all in this country of the basic dignity of every migrant. In this country, I firmly believe that there should be no second-class people. Everyone should have the opportunity to seek more of the American experience. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I want to say this. I've said this at almost every speech I give about homeland security. Homeland security is a balance. We can erect more walls, install more screening devices, and make everybody suspicious of each other. But we should not do so at the cost of, of who we are as a nation of people who cherish our privacy, our religions, our freedom to speak, travel and associate, and who celebrate our diversity 
and our immigrant heritage. In the final analysis, these are the things that constitute our greatest strengths as a nation. Luis was kind enough to tell you about my grandfather. Let me tell you a little more about my grandfather that Luis doesn't know. He died in 1956. He wrote a lot. You heard some of what he wrote. He never lost hope. This was a man who, in 1949, was dragged before the House Un-American Activities Committee to deny that he was a member of the Communist Party and gave an impassioned speech about the patriotism of the African American. Dr. Charles Johnson died in 1956, basically a second-class citizen, a man with honorary degrees from Harvard, Columbia, a sociologist, died in a train station, a second-class citizen. But the month before he died, he wrote the words that you heard Louise quote. So I say to the young people, never lose hope in your country, in your leaders. Never lose faith in the code of this nation and the democracy that we offer you. Always have hope and faith in your country and its system of government. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go sit down over here. Please, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much. So I want to, we're going to have a Q&A, so get your question. Q &A. I'm going to ask a question and then we're going to go. So I'm going to try to put this in some context for us. So you just spoke about the three and the 10 year bar and the clarification uh, of guidance, uh, the Department of Homeland Security. So I just want to put it in some context and then have you answer the question in the context. So I meet Soraida again and Soraida from Mexico mm -hmm. and she and I fall in love. We marry, I go and as an American citizen, I prove that our marriage is, is valid. I prove that I'm an American citizen, and I apply for a visa for her. And they say, and the government says, oh, Luis, certainly. Here's the visa for your wife, Soraida. It's granted, authorized. You are married. You're qualified. This is a qualified. Mm -hmm. And then they say, but by the way, Luis, take her now to Ciudad Juarez to go pick up the visa for your wife. And as an American citizen, I take my wife down there to go pick up her visa so she can come back to Chicago to live with me. But when I get there, they say, ah, sorry, Luis. Soraida must remain in Mexico for the next 10 years. And if she were from the Philippines, she'd have to stay in the Philippines for 10 years. If she was Irish, Ireland, Poland, you guys get the point. What's different given what you just explained to us today when I want to take my wife down there to get her visa? What, given that the law says she has to remain outside the country for 10 years. That's the punishment. Two things. Um, so what we did as part of our executive actions was to, to the full extent of the statute, expand the opportunity <coughs> for a waiver from that dilemma. So we had extended it to a certain class of people. Now we've extended it to those who are related to lawful permanent residents in addition to U.S. citizens. Okay. The other very significant thing that we did, the statute says in cases of extreme hardship, that waiver can be granted. But for years, there was a lot of legal uncertainty about what those two words meant. And so today, we have put out for comment uh, proposed guidance that clarifies what those words mean and does so in a way that we believe to the full extent of the case law. And this is something that I know you and others have been advocating for for a long time. And our hope is that <clears throat> this will encourage people to invoke extreme hardship because they, will, they and their immigration lawyers and my people will know what it means and we have that common understanding. So when I took my wife, so now I, before I take Soraya down to Ciudad Juarez, I can apply for a waiver for extreme hardship. I and believe, yes. I can apply for a waiver from the 10-year the bar before I go pick it up. And if I'm granted one, she gets to come back to the United States with me without spending the 10 years there. I believe that's how it works, yes. Okay, now, 
and, and then I'll just move on. So just so that, so that the audience understands, so I apply for the waiver. The fact that we have Omaira and Jessica, my two daughters, mm -hmm. and that the fact that she's going to stay in Mexico and I have to come back to Chicago to raise those kids, is that a consideration? I'd have to study the guidance more carefully, but I, common sense tells me that it would be an extreme hardship to you to have to raise those kids on your own. It would, that, that's the point. In other words, I'm an American citizen. I have to raise my two daughters without my wife. I think anybody in the audience would agree that that's extreme hardship to separate me from my wife <laughs> and my American citizen children from their mother. And I know many of you. I, I hope I haven't just gone beyond my own guidance. But that's I, OK. I just, uh, but you know what? We're going to figure it out together, Secretary, with everybody in this audience and our community. We're going to figure it out. And I, I want to thank you for the answer to your question. I think it's important because I will tell you 20% of the cases that I get in my office are American citizens who can't get the papers for their wives, American citizens who can't get papers for their husbands. American citizens and permanent residents legally here who can't keep their families together because if they do, they have to leave the country and stay there for 10 years. So understand the importance and the magnitude as we work. I don't want to oversimplify it. I don't want to take it outside the boundaries of what it is. But I guess we're going to be inviting you an awful lot around the country to explain to us uh, this wonderful new uh, initiative. So a question from the audience. Um, I'm sure there's a. Microphone somewhere out there, somebody, there you go. The mic is coming from the back. Just so you know, we have these lights on us, so we can't see you too well. Please stand up and ask, stand give up. us your name and ask your question. Microphone? Okay. I don't have the microphone. You've got a microphone. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. 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 Somebody My got name the is mic. Carla Hernandez Matz. I'm Secretary Treasurer of the United Teachers of Data out of Miami, Florida. And my question is on unaccompanied minors. So as a teacher, this is a very important issue for us in Miami because we are receiving a lot of unaccompanied minors. And so we see the stresses that they live in on a day-to-day -day basis. Some of them live in shelters, and of course, we're doing our best to educate them, their English language learner needs, and of course, their social emotional uh, environment. So I know that it was alluded that there was about a $1 billion investment in certain Central American countries, because we understand that, you know, that no parent really wants to send their child alone anywhere unless there's a dire need. So I, I want to know a little bit about that initiative and what we're doing to help these unaccompanied minors. <clears throat> I'm going to give you two answers. One, we have repeatedly stressed to parents that it is dangerous to send your child alone all the way from Central America into this country. The law requires once that child has been apprehended by our Border Patrol, we, we transfer them to Health and Human Services, and HHS then places them in a situation that is in the best interest of the child, which is most often here in this country with a parent <coughs> who is already in this country. <coughs> I'd like to see us make that long-term investment in Central America to try to address the poverty and the violence there. It's a huge push factor into this country. And there's only so much border security you can pay for and provide to try to slow down the migration. But as long as the underlying push factors exist, um, the, the problem is going to be there. So we, as government leaders in the executive branch and the congressional branch, simply have to wrestle with this and address the situation in Central America. On a more personal level, I have, on the border, as I know Luis has, talked to probably dozens, if not hundreds, of these kids. And to, to understand, why did you leave? 
And there have been a couple of really vivid um, encounters that I've had. The last one with a seven-year-old girl who came here all by herself, a seven-year-old girl, because her mother was in this country. And she was not with a brother or sister or an aunt or a grandparent, a seven-year-old girl. <clears throat> I walked into the border station, and what I, I did what I always do when I encounter like 30, 40 kids in one room, who wants to talk to me? I do the translator. And, and initially, this was a room full of girls. Initially, they were shy, and there was this one seven-year-old girl in the back who raised her hand and wanted to talk to me, and she explained to me her entire story. So every time I do this now, <clears throat> I say to the Border Patrol, I want to I, I keep track of this one little girl or of this 12-year-old boy. I want to know what happens to them. So there's a huge human and humanitarian factor to this that I understand while we have to maintain border security. And so the unaccompanied kids, is a, it's a heartbreaking phenomenon. Um, and so we just, we can put a lot on the border. We can put a lot of my people on the border. Uh, the governor of Texas can put a lot of his people on the border, but that doesn't address the underlying situation in, in these three countries. And that's what we have to make an investment in. Thank you. Other questions someone has, please. Uh, my name is Anabel Maldonado. I'm a current public policy fellow. Um, and you mentioned in your speech that uh, that CHS is focused on criminals. And my question to you is um, about Operation Streamline. I come from Arizona, and for those of, who, of, those of you who don't know, Operation Streamline is an initiative of DHS established in 2005 um, with the intent of establishing these zero tolerance immigration enforcement zones. Um, and I've, I've been, I'm from Arizona, so I've, I've seen the massive deportations of people that are criminalized just for crossing the borders. Um, so are those the criminals that you're talking about, or can you elaborate a little more? Good question. When I, when I refer to using our resources, I'm referring to those who are in the interior who have committed felonies, non-immigration related. I mean, you have the repeat returns, but Operation Streamline is a, is a policy and an operation of the Department of Justice in Arizona, which many people say is very effective as a deterrent. It is not the policy across the entire southwest border. There are some who would urge that it should be. Uh, I've been asked to look at Operation Streamline in Arizona, which we are doing now, but it's also simply a matter of resources. You can't criminally prosecute every single person who is, who is apprehended daily on the, on the southwest border. Um, the Department of Justice would do nothing else if they tried to do that. So um, <clears throat> it's, something that, it's something that I've been asked to evaluate. But again, we have to address the underlying causes of illegal migration from Central America. Uh, the numbers are far less than what they were last year and have had historically been, but they're starting to go up again. The last three months of this fiscal year, they're starting to go up again. And it's because of the poverty and the violence in, in those countries. And we, we just simply have to address that. Next question, please. I know the microphone's making its way. Um, my name is Karina Quintanilla. I am an academic advisor with Bram University in California. I'm here with HOPE, Hispanos Organized for Political Equality. My question is in regards to the number of deportations of those that are high priority with the criminal record. As you state that 84% of those that are the target that have been apprehended, how do we turn the conversation to address um, that that is a high priority and not necessarily to fuel the rhetoric of these are the people that are coming, these are the people that need to be deported, to then uh, fuel the hate that is uh, being generated as part of the national conversation. How do we draw attention to the fact that um, most people don't know that is who is being targeted as a priority and not a general sample of the population of who is coming as the immigrants? Um, I, I just, just here in Washington, I've noticed you have to say something about seven times before somebody will listen to you. So 
I don't mind repeating myself. I have, the, the numbers I gave you about the border, I have given that speech in Arizona, I've given that speech in Houston, Texas, I've said that a number of times here in Washington, to try to dispel the misapprehension that a lot of people have about a porous and open border with people pouring across. And <clears throat> the national media is starting to pay attention, but we're now in the middle of the political season, so a lot gets drowned out by the political rhetoric. But I think it's incumbent upon, and this is how I began my prepared remarks, I think it's incumbent upon those of us in public office who have the microphone to give the facts, to state our views and our policies in calm, informed terms, and to tell the public that our investments in border security have led to these results, and to tell the public about our new policies to focus more on the, the felons, those who commit multiple misdemeanors, those who commit significant misdemeanors, and how a higher percentage of those we are removing belong in those classes of people. And so I'm just gonna keep repeating that message, and I hope others will do the same. I'd like to ask you just to follow up, because I think, so in terms of numbers, Mr. Secretary, I believe at the height, um, three years ago, it was 400,000? Yes. Deportations. Yes. And where, okay, so if we're gonna compare, and we're gonna use a metric just of numbers, where are we in deportations in the last three years in terms of, and I'm not talking about those caught, whether they're Mexican or non-Mexicans at the border <coughs> and immediately return, but right. those in, the, in, my, in LA and in right. Phoenix and in New York and in right. Chicago that are apprehended and deported. Tell us a little bit about those yeah, numbers. That, that number of ICE removals was, you're correct. Fiscal year 12, it was about 409,000. That was the high. The following year was 368. FY 14 was 315. We're still determining what the number for 15 is. Fiscal year 15 ended last week. We're still determining the number, but it looks like it will be significantly less than 315. And <clears throat> the important point to stress here is the number of removals by ICE is down, but we are using those resources to invest in going after threats to public safety. And that takes, that takes more time. That's not just simply rounding everybody up that you can find to pump up your numbers. That takes time to find people in the interior who've been convicted of felonies and put them in removal proceedings. And so the president and I both wanna see us use those resources to focus more on the convicted criminals. Sure. And that's what we're doing and that's, how we're changing the direction of, of this shift. Before we Don't take on, so here's, this what, here's how I, so I'm gonna be very careful in terms of how I interpret those numbers. So the numbers are coming down, and I think everybody in the audience is probably thinking, I know someone who shouldn't have been deported, and I know someone, regardless of the numbers coming down, that shouldn't have been deported. And the right, of course, is gonna say, the secretary opened the borders and is not deporting everybody. But the numbers are coming down, and I think it's our responsibility here to make sure that the Congress does its job so that people don't have to cross the border with a coyote, but can cross with a visa. And that's the way we have to look at our border and people coming and leaving the United States of America. That's what I want to do so that you can use your enforcement. The other thing is, I think as a community, <clears throat> we also should say that while there are people who unjustifiably were deported and should be brought back and we fight for them each and every day and we are more and more successful in those cases in fighting for people every day. You know about them in your communities because there's celebrations all over the United States uh, when we win one of those cases. And that is that there are bad people in our neighborhoods. There are drug dealers, there are gangbangers, there are rapists, there are murderers, and the greatest impact they have is on the quality of life of the people in our neighborhood and we need to make sure that we separate the good people, really good, hardworking people, from the ones that are, that are doing ill in this country. And I'm ready to, to roll up my sleeves to sign everybody up uh, with the government of the United States, give them their work permit, and give them the dignity and the respect that they deserve. And we gotta make sure that the Congress of the United States gets that job done. Another question. 
Can, can I, I want to, sure. I want to add to what you said, Luis. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to put forth uh, a proposition that some, that may surprise some of you. Uh, because we in public office, we don't, we don't ask the public enough to do things for us. But I think when we make a reasonable request, they do respond. I th I'm going to submit that the people in this audience, you all yourselves are leaders, just like he and I are. You are leaders because you were motivated enough to come to this discussion. You're affiliated with CHC. You are leaders of today and tomorrow. And so you too can help deliver this message about the facts of what we are doing, what our policies are, and the direction we want to take things. And so that's one of the reasons I came here today, to have the opportunity to speak to everybody here, to explain to you where we're going with this, so that you too can help this resonate in not just your communities, but, but beyond that. Other question, please. Thank you, thank you very much. My name is Ana Sol Gutierrez. I'm a state delegate in Maryland, and I'm also a candidate for Congress. I'm running to help my tocayo resolve the immigration issues. My question is this. I am encouraged when you talk about that seven-year-old, incredibly courageous little girl who came here to find her mother. I am discouraged when the focus of the policy from DHS, as you've articulated, is primarily focused on border security and not talking at all about the humane view of who these people are. They are refugees, they are not illegal immigrants. So my question to you is this. There was a, a judge in California, Judge G, who uh, looked at the way that mothers and children were being detained and has ordered, ordered the administration to release the mother and children there. There has been dragging of feet, pushing back, reconsider, please, Judge G, from the administration. And now it's in your hands. When do you expect that you are going to obey the court order that will release all of these innocent mothers and children that are in right now in deplorable, inhumane conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the answer is October 23rd, 2015. Uh, that is the date at which the judge gave us to implement her court order, and I have announced that we are going to do that. I, I disagree with her reasoning. I disagree with her. I disagree with the underlying legal reasoning. Uh, so we have appealed, but we took a hard look at her decisions, the ones issued in July and the one issued in August, and we determined that ICE can comply with the court order, and I think that's what they should do, and that's what they they will do. Let me under, let me be clear about what that is. We've taken these centers and we are no longer using them to hold people long term. We want to transform them to shorter term processing centers because given the volume of, of families crossing the border, you simply cannot deal with them, do the necessary health screening and make the evaluations for alternatives to detention at the border at a processing center. So we want to bring these people here short term, get the average length of stay way down to fit within that court order, and then release them on, on bond, alternatives to detention. Um, and that's what, that's what should happen, and that's what will happen. These things were opened last year when we had the unprecedented spike in migration, and we're transforming them, and we're transforming their use, and we're going to comply with the court order. Next question, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Cecily Counts, and I'm one of the legislative representatives of the AFL-CIO. I'd like to ask you how you plan to help the American people understand that migration is a global issue and that poverty and violence forces people to leave Africa, Asia, 
Central and South America, we see the situation in Europe, and we also see fear mongering in this country. I saw an article in the Post the other day about people in South Carolina being afraid of the invasion of Syrians. We know that many Americans don't know the difference between a Peruvian and Pakistani, and we also know that this is a political season. So if you could talk a little bit about the public education you're doing to help people prepare for refugees coming from other parts of the world too. First of all, I have been impressed by the number of communities that the media doesn't necessarily talk about in Chicago, Columbus, Ohio, Houston, Texas, South Texas, that have embraced immigrants, illegal refugees otherwise. I've, I've been in rooms like this where <clears throat> the community has embraced Syrian refugees. There was one in particular who told me about the torture he had faced from his regime in Syria. And I said, well, welcome to the United States. I'm your new regime. And no one here is going to torture you. I brought the gentleman to tears. So I've been impressed by the number of communities. The media focuses on, you know, the, the, the community you talked about focuses on the community last year in California with the signs and the buses. But there are a lot of good communities that are in places where you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be that are very embracing of immigrants because it is part of our heritage. This is a country of immigrants. It is part of our heritage. And so <clears throat> we want to continue to support those communities and their efforts. But again, I think that through proper education and the national dialogue, unfortunately, is not always conducive to this, through proper information and education about what it means to in a country of 300 million people, except 10,000 Syrian refugees, is something that the mightiest nation on earth can probably handle. We're gonna do the screening of these people, and we're gonna do it carefully, because we should, because that's part of our responsibility. But it's also our responsibility as a global leader to accept more of these people, to provide the humanitarian aid and assistance in Syria, in the border countries, and it's something we're gonna do. And Leon Rodriguez's people are gonna be very busy doing it, uh, but it's something we're going to do and we should do. Let me just, for the purposes of, so last um, Father's Day, I and Lucille Roval Allard and um, on Father's Day went down uh, with Zoe Lofren and uh, six, seven other members of Congress. And we went down to San Antonio and we went to visit the detention centers, because we thought it was important that we go down there and tell those moms and tell those kids that there's people that care for them, love them, and are here to protect them, uh, that they are refugees, uh, that it come fleeing violence. Um, we went down there, and I would like just to say that I, I'm very happy to hear the decision the administration and secretary has made uh, uh, on October, that will be implemented by October 31st, but the Secretary and I and others have been meeting continuously on this issue. Um, he has taken steps already uh, to remedy the situation. Um, and I want to say, first of all, thank you uh, for listening to us and for allowing us to challenge you and to be res responding in our challenge to you. And I just want to say to everybody here, the, because I think the question from the AFL-CIO delegate is, is excellent, right? Here's the problem. We talk about Syrian refugees and we understand. But there is absolutely no difference between those children that arrived in our border fleeing drug cartels that behead people, chop people's hands off, rape women, control society and cause terror and fear in their communities, fleeing them and fleeing the Islamic State in Syria. None. And so, While the United States understands that Europe has its responsibility with the hundreds of thousands of refugees. And just like we had a direct responsibility, 
our actions in Iraq, our actions in Iraq and our intervention in Iraq are directly responsible in great measure for what's happening today, the displacement of hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq. But guess what? Our actions in Central America also have a direct impact. And I would just like to say to everybody in this room, we have a responsibility too. Because you know why those drug cartels have such power in those Central American countries? Because of the insatiable, insatiable appetite for the drugs here in the United States of America. And I think we need to own up to that responsibility too. So I want to make sure that we understand that we are also responsible aquí, right here. We're responsible because those are American guns and American dollars that fuel the disintegration of the societies in which those children have to flee from. And we have a responsibility to receive them. When somebody arrives at our border, this is the United States of America. We do not fall apart because tens of thousands of children arrive at our border fleeing from violence. We should embrace them. We should give them what they are not undocumented workers. They are not, they are refugees. We have laws, and we should follow the laws of our nations that say how it is we treat refugees. Because how do we talk about other countries dealing with their refugees if we're not dealing with our own in our own continent? And so I just want to say that we're going to continue to work on that. Other question, please. Actually, I think we are, uh, I think we got the red flag. Oh, we got the um, red flag. I know you're just getting warmed up, Luis, and I, I am too, but I think I we got a, one more question. Of, I'm the editor of Health and Development Magazine. I want to thank Congressman and the Secretary for the wonderful work you're doing, and especially the Latino community, community in the whole USA. People make it look at it as if uh, immigration is a Latino issue, but it's an international issue, and when you win, you win for everybody. So thank you very much. Well, let me just say to, to everybody here, we have a lot of work to do to fix our broken immigration system. I want to thank Secretary Jay Johnson for joining us today and giving us the kinds of information and the direct answer. I think we're headed in the right direction. Sure. And I just, uh, sure. I have listened to all the other speakers. I would have uh, been quiet if I had listened to them ask my questions, but they didn't. So I'm going to um, I'll make my question. And there are two uh, which could be answered in one uh, way by the Secretary. The first is the issue of abuse by parole officers and other officers who have uh, so-called uh, illegals in their custody. Uh, some of the women have been sexually abused. There have been cases of children abused. And most of the papers in Texas have documented that over the years. Apparently, it looks like the government seems to have put, uh, been putting that under the uh, carpet, and nobody is talking about that. So I, w I want the secretary to Tell us whether the department is aware of that, and if they are, what is the situation and what they are doing about that. And the second and the last question, which may be a follow-up, is the issue of adjudication. Uh, what is your department doing in situations where USCIS has gone into playing the role of adjudicator instead of the court? That's to say that cases which are supposed to be granted or refer. Uh, are not handled in that way, and they are now kept, you know, at the level of USCIS, and the people suffer for so many years. And if they are going to be reconsidered, would you consider the time that your department or USCIS made mistakes, you know, in trying to adjudicate instead of the court, and what compensation are going to do, uh, be given to people like that? Thank you. The, the, uh, the short answer is that, uh, to the first question, is I, I am aware of the um, things that you referred to, the allegations you referred to. Uh, our Border Patrol in particular um, is working to make a lot of our rules and guidelines for how we treat people more transparent. That's something Commissioner Kurlikowski is doing. I think we're headed in the right direction there. Uh, in terms of the backlog and, and the wait times and things like that, you have to realize there's only a limited amount that I can do with the laws and the resources the Congress gives us. And so we're working to streamline our procedures to allow people, for example, to apply for green cards sooner. Um, but 
there's only a certain amount I can do with the fixed resources that I have. Comprehensive immigration reform passed by the Congress would address a lot of this. Um, and so I have not given up on Congress. Uh, please wrap up. I have not given up on Congress. <laughs> I know Luis has not. And so it's something we got to keep fighting for. So <clears throat> look, we're all going to go back home after this conference. We're going to roll up our sleeves. Let me just give you a couple of suggestions. Number one, a million Latinos turn 18 every year, and they're all citizens of this country. We need to register them to vote. <laughs> Number two, there are 8.8 .8 million legal permanent residents who are eligible for citizenship today. Six million of them are Mexican nationals. We need to have them take the next step. 40,000 people became citizens last month. Let's continue to put 40,000 more people on the books each and every month through November of 2016. And let's make sure that we register our young people. Because in the end, as I told all of those young students, and they worry so much, you can see the fear. Here in Washington, D.C., they all think, well, you know, Donald Trump said what he said, and now he's getting nicer and gentler and kindly not saying the mean things. That's not the way it is in my barrio. That's not the way it is, I'm sure, for you back home. People still feel it back home. But let me tell you something. In the end, if you want to be president of the United States of America, you have to come to our community and ask us for our votes. And if we do not accede to that vote, you cannot be president of the United States of America. So I want to say to everybody that's Guatemalan and Salvadorian and Puerto Rican and Dominican and Colombian and Ecuadorian, and I'm going to get beat up because I forgot about half of the countries in Latin America, <laughs> and to all of our friends in the Asian and African community that are here and all of the wonderful Americans, because that's what we are. My grandson said it best. His dad's from Mexico. I feel Mexican in this arm. I feel Puerto Rican in this arm, Grandpa. But I'm 100% American right here. Let's make sure those values are carried out. Thank you so much. <laughs>